Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Leaders in Supply Chain Talent podcast. I'm your host, Shubh Fajdar, Head of Talent and Development at Alcott Global. I'm extremely excited to have Meta Johansson and Andrew Bryant as our guests. Meta worked in leadership roles across Asia and Europe for uh, multinational corporations for over 15 years before she founded MetaMind, a training consultancy which provides learning programs in leadership, people, and communication skills. She is also one of the six co-founders of the global social enterprise, the Inclusive Leaders Institute, which focuses on making organizations equitable and ensure that all employees feel like they belong. Meta is the author of two Amazon bestsellers, How to Make Yourself Promotable, Seven Skills to Help You Climb the Career Ladder, as well as the co-author and ideator of Unleash Your Voice, Powerful Public Speaking for Every Woman. Our second guest is Andrew Bryant, executive coach, leadership consultant, and keynote speaker. Andrew is an advisor to C-suite executives and has facilitated breakthrough learning sessions for leadership executive teams. He's the author of Self-Leadership, How to Become a More Successful, Efficient, and Effective Leader from the Inside Out, and the Amazon best-selling Self-Leadership, 12 Mindsets for Success. His new leadership playbook will be published in July 2021. Personally, I really look up to both our guests, so I can't tell you how happy I am that they are also part of the panel of experts with Alcott Global Training and Development. Meta, Andrew, delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome, Shu. Thank you. Delighted to be here with you. Great. So today we will be exploring women in leadership from a few different perspectives. Now, supply chain is perceived to be a male dominant industry. And I say perceived here because according to the latest Gartner survey, 39% of workforce in the industry is female. 17% of chief supply chain officers are female as well, which is a marked improvement from just five years back. So we are moving in the right direction. Andrew, you coach C-suite leaders or leaders about to get into C-suite. And I've heard and read stories of how you have helped a lot of women to get represented in C-suite. What are some ways you have noticed women self-sabotage or have self-limiting beliefs about getting to that level, especially in a male dominant industry like supply chain? Okay, thanks for that, Shub. Great opening question. There are two sides to the coin. There is the environment and the culture of the organization. And that obviously has a, a huge impact on the willingness of women to want to step up. So, so there's two problems. One is if a woman wants to step up, step up but there is not that uh, pathway or runway for her to do so. And secondly, if the environment crea- is such that she doesn't want to step up because it's seen that it's just not... Uh, female friendly, that there's an expectation that's a global organization, you're going to be on call 365 days a year, and that it is a highly political environment. And what we know about culture from, from Google's Aristotle research is that the number one thing that we want is some level of psychological safety, wherever we work. The, the inhibitor to really giving everything is that sense that if I step up, speak up, I'll be shot down. And women are more sensitive to that than men as a generalization. Now, I know I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble here. If I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a gender difference from, but a, from a generalization, but we know statistically from psychometric tests that on the big five psychometric, that women are more sensitive to negative emotions than men right? Men just don't notice, right? And so women are sensitive. Is this an environment that I feel safe in? And what makes it a safe environment is typically if there's other women there. So why do women not step up and show up? Because there aren't the female role models. You know, nobody particularly wants to be the first. Now, there are some wonderful examples of women around the world, you know, the first astronaut, you know, the first test pilot, the first, you know, there's been firsts everywhere. But it, it takes a very special male or female to be the first in anything. 
So for women to step up, and my research has clearly shown, the number one thing they look for is what other women are there? Are there the role models? Am I going to be the only one? Am I going to be the token female? And so that's the environmental issue. Then internal self-sabotage, as per your question, is um, along with that sensitivity to negative emotions is an oversensitivity to perfection and confidence. So women hold themselves to a higher standard often, again, I'm generalizing, than men do. And so the self-sabotage is, am I good enough? You know, what if I'm going to make a mistake? And they are, they, there's a generalization that they tend to be more self-critical than men. And there's lots of evidence that, that shows that. So uh, for a woman to step up into a leadership position, she has to be, as it were, more confident than a man because she has to overcome her own um, self-criticism around perfectionism. So she needs to feel confident and she needs to feel safe. Now, I can do a deep dive on those, but I, I'll take a pause because I've, I've, I've shared quite a number of factors there. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Andrew. And Meta, I, I just want to get some of your observations as well in terms of the self-sabotages and self-limiting beliefs when you've worked with women and yourself as well uh, as a woman in, uh, in leadership. It's, it's definitely true. It is about the self-confidence in leadership often is lagging behind with women. We do need to make sure that women are built, build up in their self-confidence. And it's also because, again, I have to say, typically women, typically men, when we're stereotyping here, it is because we don't want to say this typically every single sentence. We don't want to completely stereotype, but there are some trends. Women, they typically grow up where they are told to compromise on their own feelings, to hold their own feelings back, to make other people feel more comfortable. Take a little girl who's shouting, a little boy who's shouting. The boy gets away with a lot more shouting, where the boy, the girl is being told, be good, others will be disturbed by your shouting. And with boys, oh, they're just boys, go ahead and play. So of course, women have been subdued, hold back, held back their entire lives. So of course, that will also have effects on how we show up as leaders. What I thought was very interesting, what you mentioned just now, that in supply chain, C-suite has about 17% women right now. Yes, it's progress, but, and there's a big but here, studies show that diversity only really shows up profit, but the benefits of inclusions are only showing up when you surpass the threshold of 20%. Other studies say it's 30%. You only benefit from diversity if you get past a certain threshold and it's 17% is not enough. If you think about it, it makes sense because if you are in a room five people, you're a woman and there's four guys there and they're telling you, oh, we've always done it like that. And what you're saying doesn't make sense. And you're dismissed. What typically happens in that situation? Most people will say, yeah, I guess they're right. So that means that if you are a one woman with four men in the room, you're probably going to hold yourself back and not speak up. And this is why we need to get much further than 17% in the C-suite. We need to get to a level where we have the psychological safety and of role models, as Andrew said just now, so that women feel comfortable about speaking up. And that means that we need to go to at least beyond the 20% and probably even beyond the 30% in order to achieve that. Absolutely. Look, some great insights here. And I, I do agree with both of you in terms of both the confidence and, uh, you know, holding to higher standards. Uh, when I work with mid to senior level leaders and, you know, I see such a contrast when I'm working with uh, my male uh, counterparts and when I'm working with females. When it comes to negotiating for salaries, it is such a struggle to get women to actually take on that because they feel what are the, whatever they they are getting as the first offer is what their value is. Whereas it's with men, I usually need to have the other conversation to, you know, manage their expectations that, you know, okay, in this market, maybe 35% is not the best thing you look at. So and it's from the first get go, you know, when they are applying for a role, uh, men, they uh, meet 50% of requirements, good to go. Women, until unless they meet 100%, they feel they're not good to go so i'm i it's quite interesting that both of you had 
uh, seen that happening with women and also with women who have reached the level when they are about to reach C-suite and when they are in senior leadership roles. So Meta, you run a lot of diversity and inclusion programs, especially focused on women in leadership. What are some of the strategies and practices which uh, have helped women through your program to really move out of this ceiling, which the society and sometimes they themselves have created for themselves? There's different answers to that question. I believe that one of the reasons why the programs are so successful is that we are creating a safe space where women can explore what is leadership when you're a woman. When you look at it, the rules of the business world have been written by men for men. And it sounds maybe a bit harsh. Look at the books that are taught in MBA programs today. Look at the authors of these books. Who are these authors? White American men. <laughs> Andrew is, is raising his hand. It's me who's writing oh, I, the I, book. You know, yes. My books are you've got MBA program. I'm, not, I'm just not American. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. no, and, and I, I, I'll just uh, interject here. I saw one of Andrew's LinkedIn Live on um, uh, on Women's Day, and it was hilarious because he drove the point. He said, imagine you're thinking of a CEO. Most likely, you'll imagine somebody like me who is, you know, at a certain age group, white, male, speaks in a certain way. Uh, and, and hair. Exactly. <laughs> <Not doing that. laughs> so, uh, and, and I thought that that was such beautifully crafted, such a powerful way of showcasing how we all have those stereotypes. So, Meta, just uh, you know, letting you continue what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are making the point absolutely that the rules of the business world have been written by men for men. They have not been written with the woman in mind. And today, the world is changing. Women are are part of the workforce and we need to also reap the benefits of having more diversity in leadership, right? So that is where if we have a safe space where women can explore, how is it that I can show up as a leader? Can I embrace the more compassionate uh, values that I have and show up as somebody who cares for my team. The good thing is that there seems to be a momentum in society where it is possible to lead with more feminine values. Whether you're a man or a woman, any gender, you can lead with much more feminine characteristics today and get away with it. And this is also good news for men, by the way, before I go back to the Women in Leadership program, because I also know plenty of men who feel that they need to show up at work as a tough cookie, and they don't want to be that. They want to be themselves. So back to the Women in Leadership program, where we create a safe space where women can explore who they are and how they can best navigate the business world, where we can have very open conversations. What's wonderful is for women to discover, and it, it sounds... It sounds very trivial, but a big benefit is that you feel, you see, you hear that you're not alone. Other women are going through the same doubts, the same concerns. They keep the same secrets of what challenges they have. And sharing those strategies together, that is extremely powerful. Got it. And Andrew, what are your uh, uh, additions to it or what are your observations about this? Well, there is. So there's two things you opened up with sabotage for women. And this is a very dangerous place. I mean, obviously not a woman um, speaking to this is very dangerous, other than the fact that I have been an advocate for women for over 20 years in, in from my professional career. And um, that's the reason why we got you here, Andrew, because oh, you right. are a very yeah, strong advocate. Yeah. I am. But but allow me to be a truth teller also. Um, so Metty says something that's that's extremely important. Find a safe space, allow the women to develop. And also within the organization, there is a very sad fact that often it's not a lack of male support that prevents women rising. Often it's a lack of female support. That that when one woman rises, you know, in, in Australia we have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome. When when a poppy's too high, it gets lopped off. Here in Asia, we talk about crabs in a bucket. If one crab tries to escape the bucket, the other crabs drag it down. More often than not, there is a real concern that if I step up as a woman, I won't get the support of my sisters. And 
And there, there has been uh, a real problem with that that has to be addressed, that if one woman rises, every woman rises, right? And, and there needs to be that support. Um, and, you know, sometimes the most vicious thing to say to a woman is, you know, she slept her way to the top. But often it's not a man that would say that. It actually, it's a woman that would say that. Now, I know that is incredibly inflammatory. And hopefully, you know, at 2021, this is way behind us. But, you know, in my 20 years of working with women, that's, that's the complaint that I've heard. That if I step up, then I then have to face the ire of the other women within the organization. Um, and so that is a problem that needs to be addressed. Point one, and ladies, I you know feel free to discuss. Point two, um, and my good friend, Dr. Tanvi Gautam, who I, you know, I'm on the Faculty of Women and Leadership with at Singapore Management University, calls the Tiara Syndrome, which is that women think, if I do a, just do a great job, if, if I work my tail off, then, you know, somebody will ride up on a white horse and plant a tiara on my head and say, well done you, here's your promotion. And the reality for both men and women is that promotion into the C-suite is not only about doing great work. There are some other factors that you need to address, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but those are the two pieces that particularly women, leadership, women in leadership need to be addressed, that all women need to support the rise of women, and that get over the fact that nobody's going to ride up on a white horse and rescue you. Yeah. I, I do have a comment to the first queen bee syndrome that you have been describing. I yeah. see this as a, um, a concept or whatever you'd call it that is uh, on the way out. And it is because in the past it was this quota of, oh, we just need to have one woman to show off that we are actually diverse and we are open to women in leadership. And if there's only space for one woman, that is when you will see as the woman who has that space that everybody else has to be kept down or otherwise I'll be threatened. And the more we open leadership to everybody, the less we will have that phenomenon as well. I also see, so I work also, I initiated an organization called Keynote Women Speakers, which is run by several dozen women volunteers. And we don't have that at all in our organization. I see it as an outdated concept. And it is if we give everybody the opportunity to grow and shine and fulfill their potential, it's not going to be an issue any longer. This is also why the 17% group that you mentioned in the beginning needs to be a lot more because 17% probably know, means that there's only space for one woman in the C-suite level. And that is not enough. We need to have it much more than that percentage. Absolutely. Look, I just want to let you guys know that there are so many great comments which I have here. People are saying, great session, good to catch this live. Our biggest enemy is our own BS, belief systems and the other BS too. Second biggest enemy is jealous women who intentionally hurt or prey upon each other. Special place in uh, hell for women like uh, Maxwell, Epstein's fr friend. So we are getting some great engagement from people. And um, uh, somebody also commented, Andrew likes the danger, love the authenticity. I think the comment which you made about, uh, you know, the general perception of women. So Meta, there has been a question uh, for you, which I'm just going to uh, showcase here. Most of the time, women can feel safe in a leadership program or a coaching program, but not in the corporate space. How to create the safe space within organizations? That's a very interesting question. I'm sure that Andrew also has some, in, some insights and uh, tips for that afterwards. Now, it is first about getting the confidence about that I am good enough and I am amazing, I am awesome, I can do this. It's first about creating that confidence with yourself that you can do this, that you are good as a woman as well. You don't need to pretend to be a man. So first creating that confidence in a safe space, that often means that you're carrying yourself in a complete different way once you enter the outside world, outside of the safe space of uh, the coaching sessions, right? Now, of course, it also means it's back to you need to have enough women or people around you who are like you, support you. Um, there needs to be enough inclusion, sense of belonging. You can be yourself in the organization. How do you change that? 
that is a longer process. It, it needs a lot of review of the systems, the processes in place, and you need a lot of male allies like Andrew, who will also stand up for you, who will speak up for you when you're in the room and when you're not in the room. For instance, mm -hmm. if there's some interruption going on or man explaining, men explaining uh, you about your job, for instance, this is reality for a lot of women. Women are being interrupted a lot more than men are also in the business world or maybe particularly in the business world, right? In, in private places, it might be the other way around, I'm told by men. <laughs> anyway, women are being interrupted more at the workplace than men are. And if you have somebody in the room who says, hey, I want to hear Naval out. I would like to hear Naval's opinion. Would you please hold on for a second until we fully understand Naval's point? You need to have allies who stand up for you and speak up for you in the workplace as well. So, Andrew, I'm sure you have very strong opinions on this as well. Yeah, sure. Andrew. Well, well, I mean, I reinforce exactly what you're saying. And, and when I when I uh, work with senior leadership teams, so, you know, my ideal assignment is I'm coaching the CEO and their executive leadership team. And often the, the cultural piece um, of women in leadership will come up. And they say, well, then we want this as part of our culture. So I, I'm, I'm working with many companies who are wanting to address this. And typically they have a male CEO and I, I, you know, I'm coaching the male CEO and I say, you, you need to go the extra mile and you need to be role modeling this. And often they have unconscious bias. They think they are being woke, um, but they're not, you know, and they'll say, oh, isn't it amazing? We've got a woman on the leadership team. And, and they're actually edifying it for the wrong reasons. Not, we got the best person on the team, right? You know, welcome Jane to the executive leadership team. She's amazing. She brings tremendous value, but yay, we got a woman on the team. And so, yes, you did get a woman on the team, but you shouldn't even need to have to say that. You know, in a perfect world, Jane is there because Jane is the best person for the job, not because Jane fills the quota. Um, so again, that that's changing. Now I know for myself, as a man, that you know I'm I'm of the age. You know, um, you know the, the queen's husband. The queen's husband recently demised at 99, and as we know, Philip, you know, is famous for his gaffes and his. And he comes from a generation that I grew up into, particularly as an Englishman, where we made gender comments, we made racial comments, and it was humorous. But it's no longer okay. Now I have two teenage daughters who hold me accountable, I'll occasionally say something that I think is politically correct. And one of one of my teenage daughters is, is LGBT. I can't get all the out. She's a lesbian. And she's fully out and comfortable with that. And I will say things like, oh, alternative lifestyle. And she'll say, no, you can't say that. I said, well, isn't that politically correct? No, because if you're saying alternative, that by inference means that it's wrong. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you know, this willingness to constantly reprogram that, we, you know, I, I was brought up thinking Prince Philip's gas were funny. Now, as we look back through history, they're horrific, mm -hmm. but it was a different time. So, you know, in terms of cancel culture, please don't cancel me if I make a mistake. You know, you, you've got to cancel on intentionality, right? If somebody's desperately trying to improve. Now, to that point, as an advocate for women, occasionally, I mean, I make a gaffe. I accidentally posted something on a, on a, um, a summit I was running and the particular cut of all the speakers, one of the windows that went on social media had more men than women. And I had actually got pretty much 50-50, but that one particular pain as we'd cut it and shown, and somebody attacked me and said, well, at least you've got one woman, right? And I'm like, Zoom out, see the whole thing, but don't, you know, before you attack, take a deep breath. So here's a couple of things. You know, yes, we need to address our unconscious bias. And yes, we need to be a little bit forgiving that it is process to the point that that Queen Bee syndrome is on the way out. And I'm very glad that it is. And I, I kind of hinted at that. And I'm glad you reinforced that, Metty. But I think we need to be a little bit kind on both sides um, that unconscious bias is equally on the female side as it is on the male side. Not all men are. <laughs> 
I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So look, I'm, I'm going to move the perspective to organizations now because there have been some questions about corporations as well. What are some of the success stories you've seen where corporations have been able to, you know, bridge the gap between this representation of male and female leadership uh, over the years who you worked with and what did they do to reach you that level? So uh, Meta, uh, why don't you start with this? I've got a great example. It's not in supply chain. Um, we partner with Barilla in the region for their diversity and inclusion programs, and they recently won the Catalyst Award, which is a very prestigious award in the diversity and inclusion area. And they did this because well, it started off many years ago when there was an ad displaying to gay men, uh, or no, 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 it was um, the, the owner of the company said, we would never have gay men in our ads. And that, of course, caused a huge outcry in society of what and boycotting of lots of people in the US. They would not buy Barilla, which is, by the way, pasta. They would not buy the pasta anymore. And um, that's when uh, the CEO, he heard it live on the radio. This was an interview. And he said, oh, my God, what's going on? I need to fix this. And they focused so much on diversity and inclusion since that day. They've gone out publicly to excuse themselves. And every single meeting that they start, they start with some focus on how important inclusion is. And that is what is needed. It, is, it needs to come from the top, whereas at every single meeting you speak about this is important. Some people find it exaggerated. If you think about it, though, the companies who are in the 25 top percentile of diversity have nine percentage points extra EBIT a year in comparison to the ones who have 25% lower percentile of diversity. It's a business case. And who in a boardroom would survive by saying, I'm going to ignore an ethical way of making nine percentage point extra EBIT? Nobody would, right? So how come you are ignoring, ignoring diversity and inclusion? It doesn't make sense. And yes, that all of a sudden justifies nine percentage points, extra EBIT on an annual basis, justifies that you start all important meetings with something that's related to how is our inclusion efforts going. Uh, so that's that's a great success story. And I buy Barilla, so I feel so happy about, oh, about good. that. Thank you very much. I'm supporting Thank you. a company which is so conscious. So uh, Andrew, from your side, what are some of the success stories when you've coached uh, C-suite and leadership teams? Okay, well, I think Matty has covered it beautifully. It, it has to stop start start has to start from the top and as i said you know having ceos that are self-aware that hey you know i have a positive intent i need to improve things and it's a great story matty because i was mentioning don't cancel somebody because they made one mistake you know check the intentionality people are trying if people are making an attempt to do the right things and there are great companies with with all sorts of diversity inclusion ben and jerry's in australia which would not serve two scoops of the same ice cream until gay marriage was was uh, legalized in australia so there are there I think starting from the top, coaching for self-awareness, but also women who won't stand for it anymore. Um, I recently helped place a female finance professional as a CFO because she was passed over for the CFO role in her bank. And when she said, well, hang on, I was more qualified for this role, but you put a man in it. And they went, yeah, but we didn't think you'd mind. But if we promoted you, we thought he'd mind. And she said, see ya. And they were absolutely stunned that she walked. And, and then she called me and said, you know, you've been referred to me. You know, I've done this amazingly courageous or stupid thing, but you need to help me find the next role. And it was super easy to coach her. And, and we helped place her as a CFO in a very exciting role um, where she's going to have much more autonomy. And now, you know, I'm going to help support her to create uh, a diverse finance team in the new bank, um, which is in the digital space, which is super exciting. Wow, so, amazing stories here. Sorry, Andrew, you were saying something. No, 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 that's fine. I'm, I, 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 I'm yeah. done. Full stop. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, I asked you guys for success story, but I have some story to share because both of you talked about, you know, standing up against, you know, when you're discriminated or, you know, 
supporting having an ally uh, to somebody who's being discriminated against and i remember this story very distinctly it was you know over a decade i just started my career very new in it and i was i was an executive uh, search consultant and when the company came to me they interviewed this candidate in her early 30s loved the candidate and this was head of finance of an mnc european mnc and he calls me and he says we love her she's amazing she's exactly the kind of person look i've asked her uh, when she got married and she told me 2 years back but i wasn't comfortable asking her when she intends to have kids can you get pally with her and find out when she intends to have kid because we would not want to hire her and then she comes to us for maternity leave and you know i i can't i'm still getting goosebumps because i remember i was in my mid 20s I didn't know how to react uh, at, at this request and I asked this person again uh, sorry what do you mean and he said it would you know she would give me a very diplomatic answer if I asked her that so can you find out what she really intends and uh, I remember I hung up the phone and I went to my manager and I said look I can't work on this I cannot ask a woman when she intends to have kids and my manager said you know do what you feel like just don't tell the director why you dropped this assignment and i went back to him and i told him i can't and in a way i felt that you know that that was the right thing to do even though the whole conversation of you know standing up wasn't that big i i remember i wasn't coached when i was starting my career to stand up for yourself etc but it used to happen here uh, at that level so we need to start standing up for for ourselves uh, and calling out these things in our day to day lives as well so now changing the mood a bit uh, andrew you are one of our uh, you know you are a big advocate of women in leadership and and uh, you know a very very strong ally to get women to get on in these positions this is 2021 and there are a lot of male allies who are looking to help women in their families in their office to go to higher and higher positions what are some things which male allies can do to help bring about this equality in female representation um at at the senior level well firstly what we've already talked about is addressing their own unconscious bias and secondly mentoring women around what their own value is so um and Menti addressed this very early in the piece and it is women have to know what their value is to the organization because they have that high level of perfectionism and 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 that tendency to have slightly less self confidence when they have male allies saying hey you are indispensable what you bring to the organization is x and ameti has has referenced some of the deloit and uh some of the other uh accounting firms research around it makes a huge difference to ebit so what is a value and a value for a woman is not the role description right the value is that she brings within that role if she wasn't there what would happen right um uh, and the interesting thing around the pregnancy one is that when women do take a position they become they they commit so strongly that they become so indispensable that if they do take some time off for maternity leave the men will go to pieces so um whilst it is inappropriate to ask for when a woman is going to have a child the the re realism is that is like this terrible fear of oh my god we won't cope without her so once women are in leadership positions they they definitely make a difference so what men can do is be great mentors and say your value is i really appreciate how you do this because women need to hear this and they need to hear it from their male colleagues how well they are valued now as when meti and i coach people i'm sure many of you do this is you know one of the things i'm always telling women is you have nothing to prove of course you have some things to improve but you have nothing to prove and and that is the entry into the c suite the interesting thing about the c suite is it is a club and you know, uh, you know I, i'm not sure i'd want to belong to any club that would have me as a member but that's the mindset that you need to have right that you belong and you you shouldn't be waiting for the tap on the shoulder you should have an expectation that you belong in the c suite and that only comes when you truly 100% know the value that you bring and men can help their women colleagues 
by helping them to articulate what that value is. And that's the best strategy that I would offer to your watchers on this LinkedIn Live today. I'd actually so like much to that. add on to that because uh, I can very much relate to what you're saying too, also as a woman who's worked in leadership positions myself, that it's there is a very much overlooked issue at play here as well. Women are often not necessarily discriminated against, but simply dismissed. When you're not asked for your opinion in the meeting, then you start maybe dismissing yourself as well because you are dismissed by others in the company. When you are not given that stress stretch assignment or that promotion, when you're not asked, I was a trailing spouse for a while and it was so much assumed that my husband was in the lead for the career and he was carried around on the silver plate. And I started, I was dismissed so many times and I started also believing that I wasn't bringing as much value to, the, to professional life as he was, which was absolutely nonsense. And I did not have these people who told me, which you are advising right now, Andrew, I did not have the people who told me, Meta, this is the value that you are bringing to the company. On the contrary, I was dismissed over and over and over again. And when you carry that feeling around of, oh, maybe I'm not that good, maybe I'm nothing special, that is, that is poison for your career. And that is what we need to turn around to. So thank you very much, Andrew, for pointing out this is one of the things that men can do a lot better to support, can do a lot more to support women to simply stress, this is the value that you're bringing to our organization. This is very, uh, this is uh, valuable for me, for the organization, for our clients. That is what a lot of women need to hear. Absolutely. And that would help with the whole social conditioning as well, which we've been brought up with of how, you know, we have to be more than perfect to be able to get things and things which we get in the conversations the whole time. And I just want to highlight one of the things which you mentioned here, um, Radu, who, by the way, if you don't know Radu, he's the managing director of Alcott Global and I think if he was here, he would say, it's not possible that people don't know me, <laughs> but uh, Radu, and I love this thing about him. Uh, we just had our summit last week and he was so conscious that for every session, we had a diversity of opinion, that there was good representation of women in the summit who were speakers. And we had people from all over the world. And I think that's that's an excellent example of being very conscious and aware of how you are hearing different voices when you go about um, with with your day-to-day -day work and big summits equally so look here, go ahead andrew well I, and, and this is one thing i mean many years ago i can't remember how many years ago meti you might remember when the initiative started that you look for male speakers to sign a um, a declaration that you would not appear on an all-male panel. I think I was one of the first men to sign this um, uh, pact. So I refused as a speaker to appear on an all-male panel. Um, and I, I'll, I'll give my position to a woman uh, if I have to. Now this, if, if every man, you know, every professional man watching this says, I won't appear on an all-male panel, right? Go find a woman um, because otherwise it looks stupid right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just ridiculous. Um, that then gets more visibility for women on panels, it gets more diversity of ideas, and then, it, you know, it's changed. And, and if you see an all-male panel in the future, it's just going to look weird. So um, every man, refuse, if there's all men, give up your seat, in this case, for a woman, all right? And that'll make a huge difference. Wouldn't it be cool if we could extend this also to the boardroom if people say, yeah. I'm not going to accept that promotion into the C-suite until you also have women on board <laughs> or people yeah. of other diversity groups? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's still a long way because, you know, that uh, the, the, there's a lot of things to go from there. But I, I'm happy to report to you that we've been commissioned, Alcott Global, to actually map for one of the organizations we are working to map 
female leadership in in Asia in in the industry to see how we can help to you know get more women there and help this organization to get more women leadership in in their companies as well to have a very rounded approach i do agree with andrew's point here though that women should not be brought into the leadership just because they are women because that just undermines their value uh, of what they bring to the table so we also need to be a bit uh, careful here yeah. So look, I'm very mindful that we're reaching towards the end. So I want to get some closing comments. Um, one advice you would like to give to women who are starting out in their career. What are the things uh, that Meta you wish you knew when you started out in your career to help you progress through the organization and uh, go to senior level positions? I have two points and the first one is maybe not relevant for everyone. Uh, if I had known that there is such a thing as gender discrimination at the workplace, I would have planned my career differently. I was ignorant to it in the beginning, I must say. Uh, so that's one point that uh, know that there is such a thing as gender discrimination. And the other point, what was I going to say? Uh, it was about what would what would I wish to know in the beginning, right? The other point uh, is in mind, so I'll let Andrew speak first and I'll come with the other point afterwards. Andrew, I would okay. change the question for you oh, slightly. Right. What, what I did I know when I was starting out as a woman? <laughs> <laughs> I would say... Now that your women, uh, not your women, your daughters, they're teenage, they are going to step into uh, their careers in, in the next few years. What would be one big advice you would give them so that they can navigate their career and reach to the level they want to reach? Well, I mean, I'll go to my work in self-leadership and the distinction between self-esteem and self-confidence. And, and that advice is self-esteem is self-value. And I think we need to know that we have intrinsic value regardless of what we do. Now, the, we self-esteem is our, our reputation we have with ourselves. And, you know, I've, caught, you know, I've had a conversation with my younger teenage daughter one day. You know, she got in the car and, and she was wearing a beanie. I said, well, why are you wearing a beanie? It's hot. She said, well, I cut my hair into bangs and now I hate myself. Now, as a self-leadership coach, that's like, uh, you know, please don't say that. That's a terrible thing to put in your brain that you hate yourself. But you're valuable regardless of how you look. You're valuable regardless of what you do. So self-esteem is self-value. is separate from self-confidence. I'm confident in what I can do. And so obviously we want to develop our abilities and the things that people will pay us for, our self-confidence in our ability to deliver value. But never discount who you are as a human being. Never allow anybody outside of yourself to, to put a value on who you are. You need to have that value. And if you can intrinsically get that, if you can have that robust sense of I'm okay regardless of what anybody else thinks, then you are insulated against some of the manipulation that occurs as you climb the corporate ladder. And so that's what I wish for my daughters and every do every daughter that is entering the workplace. Have clear boundaries. Me, my sense of self is mine. Nobody gets to tell me what I'm worth. My confidence around what I do. Yeah, you can measure, you know, how fast I run or how, how many words I type or how many clients or how many billion dollars are, are, of contract I close. Yeah, you can measure that, but you can't measure me. I have nothing to prove, only things to improve. Oh my God, I love this, Andrew. I think I'm going to put it like on my laptop or all over my house. I have nothing to prove, only things to improve. As a mother of a daughter, I would love my daughter to listen to that last piece you talked about, that your value is not determined by anyone else. It's about how you intrinsically look at yourself. So 
uh, with that, we would be coming to the end of today's uh, session. Thank you so much, Meta and Andrew. This was amazing. And um, I'm sure everybody got to get a lot of value out of that. Uh, please do follow both our guests, Meta Johansson and Andrew Bryant. They, uh, the, uh, the link to their profiles is on this announcement. So feel free uh, to follow them. They both put out amazing content on LinkedIn, which uh, you would get uh, a lot of insights and benefits from. And with that, uh, see you all next week with another episode of Leaders in Supply Chain Talent. Meta, Andrew, thank you so much for sharing these insights. It was very, very beautiful. I, I have to use the word beautiful here because I feel supercharged and I loved the energy which uh, both of you brought uh, to this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shubh.